I will let a touch more in my message about what that means to see a young man that God has let me be a small part. But that's a good soul to be sowing in right there. The thing that, I, that God brought him into my life is exciting for me. Because we're going to talk about later when I speak who are we really living for? And uh, when we were here last, we we always do, and we will do it again tomorrow night. And I had to share with y'all last night. The reason I want you to write some stuff down is to share what uh, what stuck out to you and some questions and things like that. The term forgiveness came up a lot when we were here before, and so. Um, Dr. B is going to come up and, and talk to us about steps of that and what it means. And speaking of, you, I want you to know something. I do not deserve to be surrounded by the people God's put around me. I just, I look around at how God brought Dr. B into my life to take what our discipleship school has been doing to a whole other level of excellence, of theological truth, biblical truth. And then I look, I look at, at, at D.C. as a brother God brought into this that I've told him this and his wife, and I'll say it to you. I really, really, it's what Johnny said this morning. I told DC and his wife, there's no real success without a successful woman. I really want him because should God tarry and not come back quickly, I want DC and his wife to be doing way more than I could ever do after I'm gone. I'm determined as y'all heard me say about money, I don't leave much money behind it. That's not going to happen. But I want to leave a legacy of men and women that God let me sow into, that they continue going and doing far wider, far greater than I could ever think about. That's what I want to do. That is my vision. I'm giving you right now my vision. I want to leave people who I've, God's let me sow into. Dr. B is a big, big part of God carrying out that vision. So I'm not going to walk talk any longer to take up his time. Dr. B, would you come up? Let's give a man. Yeah. Good morning, men. Good morning. Good morning. It's a great joy and pleasure for me to be back here with you. Let's bow in prayer as we begin. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity to share from your word. Lord, help me get out of the way so you can be seen in and through me. Bless our time together now. I pray in the precious and holy name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As David has said, what I'm going to be sharing with you this time comes out of one or more questions that we received when we were here with you at the end of February earlier this year. Those questions had to do with forgiveness. And we weren't able to adequately and fully discuss them at that time. But I want you to know we didn't forget about your questions. We took those to heart, and this time, my times with you, which will be this time and four other times, I want to share some biblical and some practical input on the matter of forgiveness with you. So, talk to me. First of all, why do we need to talk about forgiveness anyway? We need to be set free, don't we? We need to be forgiven, don't we? We'll talk about that. Anything else? Okay. There's a nasty little verse in there about us needing to be forgivers, right? We'll talk about that. Yes. It's so important to walk in 
in forgiveness where uh, as, as one walk in forgiveness, they're walking in the spirit and they're walking in love. So without with unforgiveness, I believe that the Holy Spirit is, is the person that's kind of grieved the Holy Spirit and the, the, the dam of the flow of the spirit can continue to flow if you're walking in unforgiveness. Right. That's right. Okay. And the truth of the matter is that all of us have been hurt in life, haven't we? We all have a story to tell about how hurt we have been. Some of us have been hurt more than others. I know what it is to be hurt, and I'm sure you do too. Some of you have been sinned against terribly. Maybe you were abused as a child. Maybe it was verbal abuse. Maybe you were put down, in other words, constantly, perhaps. <coughs> Maybe it was physical abuse. Maybe you got the holy crap beat out of you. <coughs> Maybe it was even sexual abuse. Or you may have been lied about. People told stories about you that weren't true. Maybe you were walked over by some authority figure in your life. Your boss, co-worker. Maybe you've been let down by Christian. Maybe you've had an unfaithful spouse. Or perhaps it was some so-called lesser evil. Someone hurt your feelings. Or maybe you didn't get invited to a party when you thought you should have. Or someone didn't speak to you as they passed by you. Maybe they didn't even see you were there. And you did not get credit when you did a good deed. You thought someone would be nicer than they were. You thought they would say yes to your request, but they turned you down. <coughs> so we have hurts and we have difficult and broken relationships that we need to deal with, don't we? However, even more significant than that, we also find that we need to ask for and receive God's forgiveness for the kind of persons that we are, for what we have done and what we've left undone. Now, as I get into this, I want you to know that I've had a real struggle with this subject in terms of knowing what to share with you men. I've sweated a lot about it. Last year, I spoke on what we call the Lord's Prayer at the midweek Bible studies time at a local church in Thomasville, Georgia. I spoke on that for a period of 22 weeks. And you say, my goodness, how can you find that much to say about the Lord's Prayer? Well, I'm sorry, it's that rich and it's that important. And one of the petitions in that prayer has to do with forgiveness, doesn't it? And I spoke on that particular petition four times in those Bible study times. But as I looked at my material and on that teaching, I was not satisfied that I had even come close to covering what the Bible tells us about forgiveness. So I've been digging hard in God's Word lately. And in a few Christian resources. And actually I find out that there are not very many really good resources out there on forgiveness. So we're looking at God's Word. It's difficult to talk effectively about this subject. And I think it's even more difficult to do something about forgiveness. And that's what we're after here. We're not just talking about information again. We're looking for transformation in our lives. We're looking to get rid of something that may be boiling within us that we need to be free from. So, in the times that I'm going to be sharing with you, I'm going to be talking about our need to experience God's forgiveness initially. And not just initially, but I think the prayer that he's given us says that we need to do it daily. We'll talk about our need to be forgivers. And that's even harder. I mean, we like to receive forgiveness, don't we? We like to be forgiven. But I don't know that we like to be forgivers. We'll talk about how to deal with our hurts and broken relationships in a hopefully a healthy way. So I'm hopeful and I believe that at least something that I share with you in these times will be helpful in your daily life 
and in your remaining life here on this earth. So I want us to begin by doing some background thinking about forgiveness and looking in the Old Testament even about forgiveness and then we'll move on to some of these other aspects of forgiveness. Let's start by talking about our need for forgiveness. The first chapter in our Bibles talks about something wonderful that God has done for us, doesn't it? In Genesis 1.27, he says, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Now, God placed that first couple, Adam and Eve, in a perfect garden, didn't he? A perfect garden, full of all that they needed. And he told them to take care of that garden, to fill the earth, and to rule and reign on the earth. Those are all positive commands, aren't they? He also gave them one negative command, didn't he? He said, don't eat of that one particular tree in the center of the garden. So what did they do? They ate of that tree, didn't they? And what happened? God punished them, didn't he, for that disobedience. Now, when we were here at the end of February, I talked about how God has marvelously designed and grace gifted every one of us. DC has reminded you of that, the seven grace gifts in Romans 12. But do we always do what God wants us to do? I don't think so, do we? Is each one of us perfectly obedient to our Heavenly Father? No, we're not, are we? Scripture even tells us that. In Romans 3.23, Paul says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. <coughs> now, because God is holy and He has created us to be in His image, He has to deal with our sin, doesn't He? Amen. Paul tells us what the penalty for sin is. In Romans 6.23, he says, The wages or the penalty <coughs> of sin is what? Yeah. Death. Death. That's pretty serious, isn't it? Yeah. So we have a big problem, don't we? We were created to walk in fellowship with God, but we don't do what He tells us to do. And we find that we are under God's wrath for being disobedient. So if we're going to have a per personal relationship with our Heavenly Father, how are we going to achieve that? I believe it will help us to get a quick overview of two aspects of forgiveness. And then briefly look at what the Old Testament shows us about forgiveness. And, and then begin to look at what the New Testament tells us about it. So one key aspect of forgiveness in the Bible is that of doing away with or removing sin. In fact, we see the importance of forgiveness in what we usually call the Lord's Prayer. But I like to call it the Believer's Prayer because Jesus gave us that prayer to pray. The Lord's Prayer really is in John chapter 17. The prayer that he prayed to his heavenly father when he was facing the cross. He's given us this prayer, so I like to call it the believer's prayer, although I'll also call it the Lord's prayer too. It's a model for our prayers. In that prayer, we find that we first address our dear heavenly father and request that his name be honored, that his kingdom come, and that his will be done on earth. So if you notice, the first three petitions are about God, aren't they? So we call them God petitions. Petitions that are directed toward God. Hallowed be your name. In other words, your name be honored. May you be respected for who you are and what you've done. First one. Second one, your kingdom come. Third, your will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. Next in that prayer, we start with what I call the us petitions. Stuff about us, okay? They begin with, give us this day our daily bread. Now, among other things, this gives us a clue that this prayer might be a sort of daily prayer because we're asking God to give us our daily bread. In other words, what we need every day. So, a daily prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us what we need today, Father. The second us petition is the one about forgiveness. Typically, this verse is translated as follows. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now tell me, when we say debts, what do we mean? What is a debt? 
Something you owe, right? Something we owe somebody, right? For example, if you buy a house and you take out a loan with a bank in order to buy that house, what do you have to do each month? And what happens if you don't make your monthly payments? Bank takes it back, don't they? Takes the house back. Well, we owe a great debt to God, don't we? He created us. He has provided a great place for us to live. He's told us how to live, what to do, and what not to do. And we owe Him pure and simple obedience. But we don't do all that He asks us to do, do we? In other words, we don't fulfill all the responsibilities that we have toward God and toward others. For example, we should have reached out in compassion to our neighbor, but we failed to do so. And we should love God with what? All our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. But do we do that? Beyond that, we know how we should act, but we've done a bunch of stuff that we know we should not have done. <coughs> so we go to God and we ask Him to forgive our sins, our debts, right? What do we mean when we say forgive? Well... Let's think about it in terms of that bank again. What would it mean if your bank forgave the loan that you have on your house? And the address of the bank and the banker. Uh -huh. I know that's right. <laughs> but when the debt is a moral one, forgive means to pardon or to release the sinner from the consequences deserved by his actions. Forgiveness is the act of granting a free pardon or giving up a claim of repayment for an offense or a debt. In the act of forgiving, actually the cost of the penalty for the wrong that's been done is borne by the forgiver, not by the one forgiven. In other words, when God forgives us of our sin, He bore the price to buy our freedom from that debt, right? The price was Jesus hanging on the cross. So we don't have any way to pay our debt back to God, do we? So we ask God to let us off the hook, don't we? We ask Him to wipe away our debt. So that's one aspect of forgiveness. But forgiveness also involves a second thing. First of all, it's the removal of sin. But secondly, the Bible talks about disrupted relationships that need to be restored. Those between God and us, and those between us and other people. So a second aspect of forgiveness is the reconciliation of people who are hostile to God or hostile to one another. And in fact, God has even supplied the perfect and complete payment for our sins by sending His Son Jesus to earth to walk the road of obedience his entire life and lay down his life on the cross as the perfect sacrifice so that we might have forgiveness for our sins. Now I'd like to share with you some important background that we see about forgiveness in the Old Testament. You might not think too much about that in the Old Testament, but there's some really good stuff there. First of all, God is the forgiver. It's an aspect of the character of God. In Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, it says, And he, God, passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Wow. He's describing himself to Moses. In Psalm 130, the psalmist says, If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can with reverence serve you. And then over in Micah it says, Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. That beautiful picture. Throw all our junk into the 
depths of the sea. And in Psalm 103, the psalmist says, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your sins, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. God's merciful. He's willing to forgive our sins. But God is also just. He cannot leave sin unpunished. <clears throat> Under God's covenant with the children of Israel, forgiveness was granted based upon repentance and sacrifice. So we need to look at those two terms a little bit. Repentance, first of all. God is judge and repenter. It's interesting to note that the Old Testament talks about God repenting. The strongest statement of repentance in the book of Genesis is applied to God and His reaction to human sinfulness. In Genesis 6, verses 5 and 6, it says, The Lord saw the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry, in other words, He repented, that He had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved Him to His heart. So these verses emphasize human rebellion and God's dissatisfaction with His whole creation. Even the animals, the creeping things, and the birds are affected by God's response. God repented of His creation, responding to the sinful actions of human beings out by sending a flood, right? Yet in some way by repenting in this context, the Creator God became the destroying God. So we see that God is judge. He will judge sin. He does judge sin. And he repented back there because the evil had become so great that it dominated the earth. We kind of need to look around us today and begin to wonder, you know, how much farther we can go the way we're going in the world. Secondly, there are humans as repenters in the Old Testament. The other word for repentance that's used in the Old Testament is used more in relationship to humans and means to repent in the classical sense of turning to God and more specifically responding appropriately to God's law or His word. In the Pentateuch in the Old Testament, repentance is primarily a national concern. That's going to be a little different in a sense when we turn to the New Testament. In the Old Testament, repentance is a lot about the nation of Israel or the children of Israel <laughs> repenting as a whole. One example of this is a very famous scripture. I'm sure you've heard it. It's 2 Chronicles 7.14. Remember what it says? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and do what? Turn from their wicked ways, right? Then what? Then I will hear from heaven and I will do what? I will forgive their sin and heal their land. So we see national repentance there. That's what it's about. The nation as a whole repents if they will repent and seek His face. He will hear. He will forgive. He will heal their land. But in the Old Testament, we find a lot about sacrifice, don't we? <coughs> sacrifice is necessary for forgiveness. In Leviticus chapter 20, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and follow them. I am the Lord who makes you holy. You are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy. And I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. So God is a holy and just judge who must take sin seriously. For Him to remain just, He's got to punish sin. And in the Old Testament, atonement is the process by which God purifies and reconsecrates His sinful people by pouring out His wrath on the sinner or onto a substitute in this case. The substitute is the animal that's offered in the place of the person. So you get a lot about sacrifice in the Old Testament. Bringing a sacrificial animal, a perfect animal, and 
the person transferring his sin to the animal, the animal being sacrificed or killed, death. So the main thing that we see in the Old Testament is that God is a forgiving God. He does this through repentance by the sinner, and the sinner offering a sacrifice as payment for the sin. There's also another side of forgiveness in the Old Testament, even though it's not heavily mentioned, and that is forgiveness between persons. The main emphasis in the Old Testament is God is forgiven. There are a few examples, at least, of humans as forgiving. And here they are. Joseph's brothers asking him to forgive them. In Genesis 50, when, the, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father, Jacob, was dead, in other words, they said, uh-oh, now our goose is cooked. What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. Ha, huh. sure. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. Joseph had forgiven his brothers what they did to him, and what they did to him was horrible. Then another example of it is Pharaoh, the Egyptian Pharaoh, asking that the Lord and Moses forgive him and take away the plague of locusts. As, Egyptian, as Egypt was suffering the plague of locusts, Pharaoh said this in Exodus 10. He quickly summoned Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now forgive my sin once more and pray the Lord your God to take this deadly plague away from me. They prayed, the Lord took the plague away, and what happened? His heart was hardened, and it happened ten times. All right, King Saul is another example. Many years later, King Saul disobeyed the Lord by offering sacrifices instead of waiting for Samuel, the prophet, to arrive. And he said this to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. Notice what he said afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Fear motivated him. <coughs> now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. So King Saul asked for Samuel to forgive him. The lady Abigail asked David to forgive her foolish husband, Nabal. When Abigail's husband did a very foolish thing, Abel pled for his life with David. For Samuel 25. <coughs> When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, Pardon your servant, my lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please pay no attention, my lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool, and folly goes with him. So his very name meant fool, and he was acting like it, you know. And David was about to cook Abel's goose, you know. And Abigail says, Please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord, because you fight the Lord's battles, and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. Well, her last statement wasn't true, because there was wrongdoing in it. David wasn't there, as David Harris shared with us this morning. But so what does, the, what does the Old Testament teach us about forgiveness then? The simplest answer to that question is that forgiveness is something God does, not primarily something that humans do. So if, if sin, if our sin is to be wiped away and our slate made clean, only God can wipe our slate clean. That's why the vast majority of references to forgiveness in the Old Testament describe this process. Israel sins, God forgives. But there's another consideration. Forgiveness is generally granted in the Old Testament on the condition of repentance. A person doesn't walk around Israel just handing out pardons or amnesty certificates to sinners unless and until they repent. And of course we also find that the Lord set up a rather elaborate system of sacrifices in the Old Testament sacrifices that the children of Israel were to offer the Lord, showing their repentance, and asking the Lord to forgive their sins, both individually and corporately. So, if we wanted to summarize what the Old Testament is, says about forgiveness, it's a God thing, because God is the one who forgives. 
it's a repentance thing because the sinner needs to repent. And it's also a sacrifice thing because during the Old Testament they brought animal sacrifices and offered them to the Lord. When we turn to the New Testament, we still find that forgiveness is a God thing and a repentance thing and a sacrifice thing. But we also find several new things, two of which I'm going to emphasize now. Number one, Jesus is the perfect sacrifice for our sins. In Hebrews 9 it says, Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Over in chapter 10 of Hebrews it says, When this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So one thing we find in the New Testament is that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Even if we laid down our lives, it would not be a perfect sacrifice, would it? Because we're sinners. We're not holy. And God can only accept a perfect, holy sacrifice. And that's what Jesus was. And secondly, in the New Testament, there's more of an emphasis on individual repentance. We see this in the tax collector who went up to the temple to pray. The Pharisee and the tax collector were there. The tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said what? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He acknowledged that he was a sinner, and God heard his prayer. We see it again on the day of Pentecost. When people heard Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, they were cut to heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. Guess what? That includes us. For all whom the Lord our God will call. So, in the New Testament, forgiveness is a God thing and a repentance thing, but we also see an emphasis on Jesus as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. That's the only reason we have hope. And we see more of an emphasis on the need for individual repentance. So, in terms of our personal relationship with God, there are two aspects of forgiveness that we need to be clear about, and I'm almost done. First, because of who we are and what we have done, we have a need to ask for God's forgiveness initially. But, as we're going to talk about this afternoon, we also have a need to ask for God's forgiveness on a daily basis. And we'll look at that this afternoon. But for now, let me say something briefly about our initial need for God's forgiveness. God's Word tells us that God created us. If God created us, then He has the right to tell us how we should live, right? And His Word tells us what? That all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If that's true, then we stand under God's judgment. No more. And there is no way that we can pay for our forgiveness, even if we were to lay down our lives. Because God requires a perfect sacrifice, and that leaves us out, doesn't it? Because we're all sinners. The beautiful thing, though, is that God has prepared a way for us to receive His forgiveness. He sent His Son Jesus to earth to walk the road of obedience His entire life and to lay down His perfect life as a payment for our sins. And that opens the door for us to accept the free gift of payment for our sins. So in the New Testament, we see that forgiveness is a God thing, it's a Jesus thing, it's a repentance thing, and it's an acceptance thing. So if we want a personal relationship with God the Father, His Word tells us what we need to do to achieve that. 
We simply need to acknowledge what Jesus has done for us. We need to repent of our sins. And we need to accept Jesus as our Savior and Lord. Once again, Peter said on the day of Pentecost, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And then Paul talks about this same thing over in Romans chapter 10 where he says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in Him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Believe, repent, accept, confess. That's the big initial step of experiencing God's forgiveness for each of us. Now, some of you here this morning may never have done that yet. My friend and partner in the work of ISCL, David Parrish, would like to add a word about that initial step of experiencing God's forgiveness. And I'll be handing out a prayer that you could use either personally or for someone you know that needs to accept Jesus. There's something that we we never ever 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 want to do, and that's make an assumption about something as critical as eternal security, eternal salvation. A man asked me a question about 28 years ago, 29 years ago. He was not a pastor, he was not a theologian. And I want to ask you, you and I want to ask you two more. This man looked at me and said, David, I see your life. You're in it for the moment. You, 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 you're looking for right now the party around you right this moment. And he said, I want you to think about one thing. 